In case you don't know me, my name is Yvonne Cox, and I'm one of your teachers and a group leader. My husband's name is Owen. He's a southern boy from West Virginia, accent and all, and he doesn't think he has one. I have an 18-year-old very sweet stepson who started college this year in a seriously high-maintenance cat. I love coffee, and by the way, God created coffee on the third day of creation with all plant life. So if anybody gives you any grief about your coffee habits, you tell them God said it was good, right? <laughs> so if I asked each of you for a short introduction, you would probably share similar information, right? You would tell me your name, a bit about your family, a job, your hobby, how long you've been in the desert, and you might share your love of chocolate. But when it comes to an introduction of God, we find God uses the creation process to tell us about himself in both his words and in his actions. And when you think about that, it's actually overwhelming that the God who has the power to create a complex world wants to know us. So how can we know him? He reveals himself on every page in our Bibles and in every sunrise and sunset and in the flight of that delicate hummingbird and that enormous splash of the whale and finally at the cross. And it's hard to fathom that he wants us to have a relationship with him, not a casual phone call, not a text every now and then, but an intimate, loving relationship with him. In Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24, God says, Let not a wise man boast of his wisdom, nor let the mighty man boast of his might, or a rich man boast of his riches. But let him who boasts boast of this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness in all the earth. For I delight in these things, declares the Lord. That is why we study our Bibles to know God and his plan for us. And in our study, we will spend a little time on science theories of creation, but just a little, because instead our focus is on the story of creation that's listed in our Bibles. Ladies, please know I am not against science. Actually, I'm fascinated by it. But we always need to remember science is based on theories from studies that constantly change with new information. And so man is always looking for new information. What is the heart of this search? It's man's desire to understand the universe, the world, himself. And one of the most explored questions that is asked is, why am I here? Why do we have this desire to know why we are here? And Ecclesiastes 3.11 tells us that God put eternity in our hearts. He placed an awareness in all of us that there's something more than just this world that we live in. This verse in Ecclesiastes also tells us something else that's very important. It tells us no one can find out the work that God does from beginning to end. So it's actually pointless to try to figure out all the details of creation. And more importantly, this lack of detail in the creation story is by design. God could have gone into all the details and the entire process, but ladies, he didn't, did he? It's clear he does not want us to focus on the creation, but on the creator, him. Henry M. Morris was an engineer and a Christian apologist, and he said this, the only proper way to interpret Genesis 1 is to not interpret it at all. That is, we accept the fact that is meant to say exactly what it says. So today, we're going to focus simply on what God says. And speaking of words, I'm sure you noticed every time you read, God said something miraculous happened, didn't it? So the title of our teaching is God Said. So we, for, before we begin, ladies, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you, Lord, and we are just in awe of your creation and we're in awe that you desire for us to have a relationship with you. As we walk through this 
amazing story of creation, Father. I pray that we all learn a little bit more of who you are, of your majesty, of your wisdom, of your righteousness. And Father, I pray that we have no distractions here, Lord. And I pray, Father, that you would just speak to each lady just very individually, Lord. You know where she's at. You know what her struggles are. And we know, Lord, that you love each woman in here so dearly. So, Father, we just thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. So as we begin our study, I want to map out the journey because we are climbing to a high peak. And I don't want to lose anyone along the way. Several years ago, my dear friend Marilyn, who's an experienced hiker, took me on a hike. So about 20 minutes in, I'm gasping for breath, my legs are aching, and I'm starting to regret that I even agreed to go on this trip that supposedly is leading me to this spectacular view. And as we kept going, she kept moving faster and faster. And finally, I said, stop. You are killing me here. And by the way, quit pointing to the top of the peak, because every time you do that, I feel like giving up. <laughs> I said, instead, point to that rock over there and say, guess what? When we get there, we're stopping for water. And then point to those trees over there and said, guess what? We're going to have a snack. Do that all the way up. And then I can go with you. So ladies, we are hiking up to the top of a mountain to get a glimpse of our glorious God. But first, I'm going to tell you about our steps along the way. Our first stop will be verses 1 through 5 in chapter 1. And because these are so foundational, we're going to spend a lot of time on these first five verses. Then we'll briefly examine verses 6 through 31 and finish chapter 1. And then we'll close with verses 1 through 3 in chapter 2. And by the way, our hike to the top of the mountain will be spectacular, but we'll still have time for group. So let's begin with verses 1 and 2 from the ESV text that's in our study. I will also read two verses out of the King James Bible, and I will explain why in a few moments. So let's start hiking. Slide. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So now I'm going to read it for you in the King James Version. Next slide. In the beginning, God created the heaven and earth, and the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Now you may be thinking, uh, it looks pretty much the same. The King James Version uses the word moved instead of hovering. Okay, but this difference is not key. They essentially mean the same thing. However, here is one word in the King James that many versions do not include, and that is the word and. Many Bible versions don't use it today. And I'll explain why. When the Bible was translated from the original languages of Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, we need to remember they were not written like what we see in our Bibles, in chapters and verses and organized lines. Instead, the books of the Bible look like this long letter with run-on sentences. Slide. So, next slide. There you go. Okay, that is what the text looked like. So, Bible translators separated into verses and chapters, put in punctuation, and later other versions were printed with the goal of making the Bible easier to understand. And that is great. It's very helpful. Otherwise, you're reading something you don't understand. But as we read our Bibles, we find there are some sections that are really easy to understand, right? And others, you read them and you go, I have no clue what they just said. So in these verses, it's helpful to research the original language of Hebrew or Greek. So today, I'm going to go back to the Hebrew language for our teaching because I found that grammar actually plays an important role in understanding the first day of creation. So I'm going to give you a very short grammar lesson, but we will not be taking a test. So please know, I am not fluent in ancient Hebrew, but my go-to Bible scholar, Dr. Baruch Korman, is, and this is how he explains it. The original Hebrew text joined verses 1 and 2 with the conjunction and. Don't worry if you don't remember what a conjunction was from your English classes, okay? It's a word that combines 
two or more related thoughts into one sentence. Now, the word and isn't just any conjunction. It happens to be called a special conjunction, a a coordinating conjunction. And what this does is it coordinates two or more sentences or words which are of the same importance. So in other words, when you have the word and, what follows is directly related to the first phrase of the verse. So now when we read, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So why is this and so important? When Donna taught a few weeks ago, she mentioned, while there are many theories on how old the earth is, our church believes in the literal six days of creation, six 24 hours, okay? Here's where the grammar comes in. Those who believe in the gap theory believe that there was a great time span between verses one and two, because in newer Bible versions, verse two does not begin with and, okay? It just says the earth was without form and void is how verse 2 starts. This has led to that theory that there's a gap between the creation, when God said he created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. But remember, and ties verses 1 and 2 together, and this eliminates the gap. And it's important to understand this because as we walk through this, we know that God's creation is a perfect process. So again, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. So here in verse 2, we find creation is now without form. First, God creates the heavens and the earth, and now we're told it's without form. The Hebrew word without form means formless, confusion, a wasteland, wilderness. And the Hebrew word for void means empty. Now, if you know me well, you know my middle name should be Y, because I'm always asking questions. I drive my husband insane. So, of course, I read this text and I ask, why would God create an earth as an empty wasteland? It seems to contradict other verses, such as Deuteronomy 32.4 that says, God's work is perfect. Isaiah 45.18, the Lord who created the heavens, who is God, who formed the earth and made it, who established it, who did not create it in vain, He formed it to be inhabited. And then in Isaiah 55, verse 11, God says, So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void. But it will accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. So if you're taking notes, next slide, point one, God is omniscient or all-knowing. Ladies, God's purpose and order flow from his omniscience. He has infinite awareness, understanding, and insight. He has complete knowledge of man and of the universe with no limits. God acts in his perfect knowledge. The order of creation that's listed here in Genesis 1 speaks of an all-knowing God who created the necessary elements for plant, animal, and human life. Every act of creation is perfect in itself and in perfect order. Several years ago, I attended a lecture at Biola University, and it was featuring this Australian biologist. Now, this man did not know Jesus, but he did believe in a higher power that created the heavens and the earth. He explained this complicated biological process most of us did not understand, and it was clear that none of us were getting it. He finally does this. He says, the likelihood of the universe and the earth and the existence of life occurring by a set of random acts is thinner than this card. So, why was the earth empty or void? Ladies, that was the plan. An empty earth was perfectly in line with God's will because he was going to fill it. It's like a watercolor painting of a landscape. I don't know if anyone has ever done watercolor painting. It's a very fun process. But step one of painting a landscape is you first paint the background. So you have your paper, and first you wet it down. Then you put your colors on. And what happens is the colors start bleeding all over the page. And depending on how many strokes you put on, the colors are all over the place. But then you have to let it dry so you can start adding to it. 
But if you just looked at it from that first step, the painting looks like a mess, but not to the artist who can already see his finished work. This was the difference between the earth being void. God's creation is his masterpiece. And because we know he is perfect, we know each act of creation is by design. So what's the next step in bringing creation to life? It's a beautiful act of the Holy Spirit. You may recall in Genesis 1, we learned that the Hebrew name of God is Elohim. It's plural because it communicates the Godhead in three separate persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Ladies, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit were all present and participated in creation as we learned. And here in verse 2, we are introduced to the work of the Holy Spirit. The word for spirit in Hebrew is the word ruah, and it means wind. It resembles breath. And this is why the Holy Spirit is referred to as the breath of God. And it is the Spirit of God who moved over the face of the water to breathe life into an empty earth. And the Bible describes all creatures as having the breath of life. God's breath is in all living things, plants, animals, and man. Let's move on, verses 3 through 5. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, and it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. Next slide. Point two, our God is a God of redemption. Here we find God redeems the earth from darkness. The physical separation of light and darkness had to occur before the next steps of God's creation could be accomplished. Without life, there cannot be life on the planet as we know it. The light from the sun warms the earth, and this is what drives those global weather patterns. And what it does is it initiates a life-sustaining process called photosynthesis. And if you don't know what that is, which was a long time ago when I was in school, that is the process where plants convert carbon dioxide into their food by using energy from the sun. But beyond the physical aspects of light, we know in scripture that light is associated with righteousness. And throughout the Bible, there's a battle between light and darkness. And here in Genesis, we read that God separated the light from the darkness by the power of his word. What is beautiful is the words light and the phrase the word or how God describes Jesus in his role as the redeemer. And in John 1, 1 through 5, we learn in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life and life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and darkness did not comprehend or overcome it. And in John 8, 12, Jesus himself said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Don't you love this? We're only on verse 4, the first day of creation, and God gives us a picture of his plan of redemption through Jesus, who would come in the form of a man, die on the cross, and forever conquer darkness. Just imagine the first time the Israelites heard the story of creation, of how God separated light from darkness. And they may have recalled when God covered the land of Egypt in darkness for the ninth plague, he separated his people and provided supernatural light in their homes. The Pharisee Saul, who would later become the Apostle Paul, had encountered Jesus on his way to Damascus. And he experienced blindness, darkness, for three days before Jesus illuminated his life with truth. Paul would later become one of the greatest missionaries to proclaim this light. And when Jesus, the light of the world, hung on the cross, darkness covered the land in the middle of the day. And when he gave his last breath, the body was laid in a tomb in darkness for three days. And then he rose as the risen Savior offering light to all of us. The separation of light and darkness in scripture is used to depict life and death. And as we continue in this chapter with the other five days of creation, we'll continue to see God separating the different elements and each time stating his work was good. God sees separation from darkness to light as good in our lives.
And ladies, as believers, once we make that choice to move from darkness to light, we have to separate ourselves. In 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 18, we're called to be a separate people. We're not to be tied with unbelievers because light should not be partners with darkness. Now, does that mean we shun our non-believer friends and family? Of course not. We need to show them the hope of Jesus. But as we continue to lead a redeemed life, it becomes natural, the separation, because what they're doing and what seems fun is no longer fun to us. And I know many of you have experienced a distance with family and friends after you chose Jesus. While you love them, we also know that darkness cannot be with light. Darkness hates light. So they ridicule us. They don't want to hang out with you. You don't get invited anymore. But don't give up, ladies. Just keep praying and shining that light. Before we move on, let's talk about what was the source of light on day one, because in verse three, three we read, the sun was created on day four. So on day one, what was this light that div divided the light from the darkness? There's a couple of theories on what this light was, but scripture doesn't give us the physical source of this light, but it does give us the supreme source of light. Hebrews 11.3 says, By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. I love what Campbell Markham said. He's an Australian pastor. And this is what he said about that mysterious light on day one. He said, God wanted us to understand that light and all it stands for comes not from any created thing, but from God himself. God makes this crystal clear that he is the source of illumination, wisdom, knowledge, and truth by creating light three days before he created the sun and the moon and the stars. And ladies, while this miraculous light was not the sun, day one still established the 24-hour day when God said the evening and the morning were the first day. Let's read verses 6 through 8. And God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so. And God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening and there was morning the second day. Okay, so what is this expanse? It is the atmosphere or sky called heaven that separates the water from the water. Now, this act of creation is a little bit tougher to understand as you're looking water from water, okay? But it's tough until we understand the creation of plant and animal life. This act of creation actually put in place of what we now call the water cycle. I love it when science discovers the glory of God and then they give it their name. In 1580, there is a hydraulic engineer named Bernard Palissy, and he gave that name to God's water plan. He called it an atmospheric water cycle. So the water cycle describes where water's on the earth and how it moves. Water's stored in the atmosphere, in the sky, on the land surface, and it's below ground. It can be liquid, solid, or gas, and it cycles continually. Now, energy from the sun and the force of gravity drive the continual movement of this water. And the sun's energy causes liquid to evaporate into water called evapotranspiration. And this is the main way water moves into the atmosphere from the land and surface and oceans. Gravity causes water to flow downward. It causes rain, snow, and hail to fall from the clouds. This is important because God created the firmament on the second day to separate the water before he created the sun on the fourth day so the sun's energy can fuel the water cycle. Remember, ladies, God is omniscient. He knows everything. And Isaiah 46, 9 through 10 tells us, I am God. There is no other. My counsel shall stand, and I will accomplish all my purpose the order of creation that is listed here in Genesis 1 speaks of a God who created the necessary elements in perfect order for plant, animal, and human life to exist. Next slide. Okay. This mathematician named Dr. Peter Stoner, 
is using science, and he said Moses' chances of writing Genesis in perfect order would amount to one chance in 31 sextillion, that's 31 followed by 21 zeros. That's a lot of zeros. In other words, pretty much impossible, but not for our God. Let's move on to day three as we continue to marvel at God's creation. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth and the waters that were gathered together, he called the seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruits bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit, in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good, and that was evening and morning, the third day. Here we find God separated the water from the water, which was critical to allow plants and fruits to grow. We also learn that God commanded all the vegetation, the trees, the plants, to reproduce after its kind. This command occurs 10 times in chapter 1. So God decreed there was to be no more change. Let's move on beginning in verse 14. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. So here we find that since the beginning, man has used God's provision of the sun, moon, and stars to mark seasons, measure time, and direction. The details of God's creation are just phenomenal, and it really makes my head spin. So think about how many stars exist. Ladies, there are trillions of stars in the universe. Yet in Isaiah 40, 26, we learn that God has personally named each one. And our same God tells us in Luke 12, 7, that he knows the number of hairs on your head. And this should not surprise us because remember in verse 2 of our text, we learned the Holy Spirit moved over the water. And this is a picture of God's loving care of his creation. The word moved in Hebrew also means to brood. And if any of you are familiar with birds or have chickens, you know that brooding is a term given to a dedicated mother bird. She has begun to sit on and incubate her eggs day and night, covering them with her wings to bring them to life. Our God isn't just into the details of his creation, ladies. He cherishes his creation, and that includes us. Now let's read verses 20 through 25. And God said, let the water swarm with swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures and every creature that moves with which the water swarm according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters and the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. Here we find God commanded the water to fill up with living creatures and the skies with birds, which explain why we have so many ravens in the desert, right? <laughs> but did you notice God filled the earth to overflow with life? And it reminds me of the verse in 2 Corinthians 9, 8 through 11, that tells us God is able to make all grace overflow. Clearly, God, in his graciousness, was preparing an earth overflowing for man. Let's move on to verses 24 and 25. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things, and beasts on the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and the livestock according to their kinds, and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Here, every animal not created on the previous days was created on day six. 
and like the other animal life, he created them according to their kinds and category, categories, livestock, creeping things, reptiles, and then the big guys, lions and tigers and bears, right? And again, the sixth day was a perfect day to create them because the earth was now filled and could sustain them with the plant life. And when God finished creating an animal life, we find again that he saw his work was good. And now it was ready for his greatest creation, man. Verses 26 through 31. And then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image and the image of God he created him, male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food, and to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the heavens and to everything that creeps on the earth, Everything that has a breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Here we learn that man is created in God's image, male and female. There is no room for interpretation. God stated he created two genders, period. And then the first thing he did was to bless them. Genesis 1.22 is the first occurrence of God blessing his creation. He blessed the sea creatures and the birds, and he told them to be fruitful and multiply in the earth. And here in verse 28, God gave a similar blessing to Adam and Eve, adding that they were to exercise dominion or care over creation. The word Hebrew word for bless means to praise or congratulate, and it's also a statement of goodwill, and it can come, though, with a condition. Just prior to his death, Moses would write in Deuteronomy 30 his instructions to the Israelites that obedience will bring blessing and disobedience death. Now, God's blessing of providing a perfect planet with, came with two conditions. In this week's lesson, we learned that man was to exercise authority over the planet to be caretakers of God's creation. And ladies, when God blesses, us, whether it is spiritual or material, we must care for it like Adam and Eve were instructed. So if God has given you a gift, take care of it and use it for his glory. Secondly, Adam and Eve were commanded to procreate and fill the planet. Sex is a wonderful thing. It is good in a covenant marriage. And I know our society does not confine sex to marriage, but that is God's plan. Our text also tells us that God provided for all their needs, including the food, and we learned what they were to eat. They were to eat vegetables, fruit, seeds. So man and all animal life were told to be vegetarians. And at this point in our story, in this creation story, there was no death. So animals did not eat each other, nor did man eat animals. But ladies, when sin enters the picture, the consequence is always death whether spiritual or physical. But we need to be clear that eating meat is not a sin, and that's clarified in both the New Testament and the Old Testament. In Deuteronomy 18.3, we know that when they brought an animal sacrifice to the priest, they were to set aside a part for the priest to have food. And in Mark 7.18, Jesus said, it's not what you put in your body that defiles you. It's what comes out of your heart. So as we end this miraculous chapter, God views his work and states, it was very good. Chapter 2, thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. So we had a question in our homework. Did God rest because he was tired or just flat out exhausted? No. Isaiah 40, 28 tells us the Lord, the creator of the heavens and the earth, doesn't faint. He doesn't grow weary. Ladies, God rested or ceased activity because he had accomplished everything that he set out to do. God doesn't need rest. 
but he does call us to rest. After God rescued or separated his people from Egyptian rule, he gave them the Ten Commandments. And this concept of rest is found in commandment number four. And that's chapter 20, verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And what's important to remember is this. The fourth commandment is part of a section of the first four commandments. And that defines our relationship with God, the relationship God wants to have with us. So you may recall the first commandment is don't have any other gods before him. The second commandment, do not make idols. The third commandment, do not take the names Lord in vain. And then the fourth commandment is to remember the Sabbath day. These first four commandments tells us how we're to love, worship, and honor him. And in the Old Testament, they honored that day was a strict day. And in Exodus 31, we learned that anyone who profaned or disrespected the Sabbath day would be put to death. Or whoever did any work on it would be cut off from among their people. But when Jesus came, he came to fulfill the law. All the Ten Commandments and the other laws that were given, a total of 613, they had to be followed to the letter. But when Jesus came, he wrapped up all that law into two commandments, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself. So today, we don't live by strict rules on how to observe the Sabbath. However, observing the Sabbath rest should be our joy that flows from our love for Jesus. And Jesus described what this rest should look like. In Matthew eleven twenty eight, he said, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Observing the Sabbath is coming to him, spending time with Jesus to rest, to worship, to hear his voice. It's not a nap. It's resting in our salvation, in his promises, and in his love. We accomplish this by setting aside time to worship him and to grow in our knowledge of him and to create relationships among other believers to encourage each other. So you can observe the Sabbath on Sunday, Wednesday, any day of the week, as long as we are setting aside that time, that quiet time with him, because that's how we get to know him. As God introduced who himself, who he is to us, we learned he is a God who is all-powerful and all-knowing, and nothing surprises him. So the problems that you are facing, he knows all about them. And through his power, you can get through them. He is a God who desires a relationship with you at the cost of sending his beloved son to die on the cross so we could be redeemed and enter into a sweet, intimate relationship with him for all eternity. He's a God who cherishes you. He knows your smile, your voice, your silly habits, even your nickname. He is so caring that he knows how many hairs are on your head. So I have one last question out of this study. Who would not want to know this God? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you because you are glorious. You are amazing. You are all-knowing. And your love just is astonishing what you gave for us, Lord. And so, Father, I pray, Lord, as each lady goes to group and shares her answers, Lord, that this is a great time, Lord, of continuing to explore who you are, Lord, to get gain a better understanding of you, Father, Lord, and that they could share their answers and encourage each other, Lord, like we are doing here today. Today is a Sabbath day for us here as we're listening to you today, Lord. So, Father, we pray that we all leave here with rest and assurance and who we are in you. And so we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.